Food for Thought on News Talk 760 WJR is presented by Farm Bureau Insurance of Michigan and by the Food Bank Council of Michigan, creating a food secure state. Here's your host, Dr. Phil Knight. Today's show I'm really excited about. Jerry Brisson is here in the studio with me, and our guest this week is Kirk Mays, the CEO for Forgotten Harvest. And I think what you're going to experience in this show is going to be very, very refreshing because you're going to see two nonprofit CEOs, leaders who are working together, and they bring a sense of being able to be able to work together in order to complete and not just compete. And the end result is all of the people, all of Metro Detroit, all the counties that they serve together, the people there win. Come back and be with us. Welcome back to Food for Thought, sponsored by Farm Bureau Insurance of Michigan and the Food Bank Council of Michigan. Once again, here's your host, Dr. Phil Knight. Here with Jerry Brisson, the president and CEO of Gleaners Community Food Bank and the chairman for the Food Bank Council of Michigan Board of Directors. Jerry, welcome back to the studio. Great to be here. So today we have um, a show that we've been anticipating And that's because we have Kirk Mays, the CEO for Forgotten Harvest. And Kirk, thanks for making the trip down to the uh, great voice of the Great Lakes, WJR. Jerry, Phil, thanks for inviting me to the party. It's great to have you. Um, Kirk, uh, just as a way of introduction, um, I mean, I know people across this uh, region here and really across the state know who you are. They know Forgotten Harvest. But tell us... uh, Tell the listeners a little bit about your background because uh, I'm really interested to hear uh, the or the community organizing and how that led you to Forgotten Harvest and to this mission. Yeah, so uh, without going too deep into it, I'm essentially I'm born and raised in Detroit. Uh, my parents are immigrants. I'm first generation of uh, immigrants from Jamaica. So I grew up in a Caribbean household, going to school right here in uh, Metro Detroit. Uh, went to Michigan State for uh for college and pretty much stayed in michigan my whole life right um came out of school did some sales and that kind of stuff but really was uh bit by a bug to try and do something to impact um, our community when i came out of school we were just looking at i mean growing up in this town uh you could kind of feel the pulse and kind of uh, sense the, the 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 changes in the wind as far as the autos not hiring people at the same kind of frequency as right. they were as I was growing up. People starting to get laid off slowly but surely. Jobs that were sure jobs and uh, the ease of access to get into like skilled trades and that kind of stuff. It was drying up enough that we could tell. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I got out of school. Um, my buddies and I came together and we decided that we wanted to do something to give back to the community. I went a hundred plus percent into that and it changed me. It changed my prospects of what I wanted to do with my life. It changed, uh, what was important to me. Um, and it was just a moment in my life where, uh, I got focused. I was, it was a formative part of me becoming an adult and responsible, uh, to my community and to who I am. So that led me to starting an organization, working with the Skillman Foundation Good Neighborhoods Initiative for a number of years. Right. I was posted in Brightmore to, uh, support the efforts of that community the nonprofit organizations and the f- people over there. We stitched together a vision, uh, for revitalizing the Brightmore community that still is in the hand of that hands of that community, working with a number of organizations, uh, that that work uh, led me to being uh, tapped by Mary Duggan for his deputy for the economic development team just for the first six months. And then I got a call, uh, which I was really kind of uh, initially, honestly, resistant to because I was in Mary Duggan's administration, sure. the administration you kind of yeah. want to be a part Exciting of. Exciting times. Yeah. I, I started this path, kind of wanted to do the most I could. I'm right. um, in Detroit, kind of going into the in, into a blind situation and found some success and, and landed in the place you want to land. Right. Um, like as far as being in the front lines, working with the mayor and, and, and working to turn the city around. And I got this call 
about Forgotten Harvest. And uh, after a lot of deliberation and talking with my family and the people that are most important to me, I decided to put my name all the way in the hat. And it turned out that they actually picked me. Wow. Uh, so I've been here now for a few years, actually three years in August. Right. And it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made to be able to work with folks like you guys um, to kind of think about ways that we can impact people in our community um, and, and reduce food insecurity amongst uh, people who are, are suffering from that um, in our society. It's it's pretty cool job. Well, it is. It is cool job. It's a it's a mission that that is filling you know yeah. i mean it gives you a lot of purpose no it pun gives intended, you a lot of right? yeah no <laughs> pun intended <laughs> uh, purpose and passion but i just want to i want to share with everybody this is um this is what i've learned from you um i've been around you know i got a lot of gray hair here so i've been around and i've certainly been around the world a couple of times uh you have one of the best strategic minds Thank you. that i've ever encountered in my life and i enjoy our conversations you sh- you make me better. You make me think different. You think me. You make me think in depth, and uh, you you are a tremendous asset to this entire mission of trying to create food security, not just in Southeast Detroit, but on a statewide basis. Well, I, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, I got to give credit to my mom for being a matriarch and an old school parent. So my strategic thinking came from the fact that she did not spare the rod. (laughs) (laughs) And I wasn't necessarily uh, uh, by the textbook kind of kid. So I had to be real clever and quick on my feet when I was uh, getting myself (laughs) into some kinds of problems sometimes just to avoid the the wrath of mom. But no, honestly, it it does go back to uh, solid upbringing. Uh, I I would say probably your last version of modern day old school values right and uh trying to look at things from a solutions finding perspective um, understanding that uh, the work that we're doing has an urgency to it that even if we feel it it's 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 multiplied by a hundred when you talk about the people that we're here to serve well he's kirk mays he's the ceo for forgotten harvest and um i guess one of your crosstown partners in this work is my co-host jerry brisson so that's right Jerry, uh, my job from here on out will be to try to uh, make sure you you two uh, stay within the boundaries because I've heard your conversations. Uh-huh. They're and they're riveting. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> I, I will say this, and I and I think that's a great launching pad uh, for a conversation with Kirk because one of the great joys of working with Kirk is that there really are no boundaries to whatever has to be done to solve this problem. I'm going to frame it even this way a little bit. I don't think you can understand our work if you're not hungry. And while there is a hunger that's physical that we're trying to solve by making food insecurity go away, there's there's also a hunger that says this is urgent, it is important, it is immediate, and when you're hungry, you're willing to do things not just out of desperation, but out of absolute necessity. And man, Kirk is hungry. Thank you, man. And having people in this work that want to solve it from that perspective is critical. And so we've presented on several occasions. We've come a long way in terms of Gleaners and Forgotten Harvest mm-hmm. working closely together and strategically. And I will say honestly, um, if you support Forgotten Harvest, you're supporting one of the best-run organizations in town. There's no doubt about it. Well, thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate that. Uh, I, again, value our friendship. Um, I value your leadership and your uh, your insight and experience in this work. So I definitely recognize that from day one, I was sitting up under a guru to try to understand what was going on. And I think that's something that people uh, would benefit from understanding when we talk about uh, the importance of us being partners and looking at this work in a uh, collaborative way, it, there are some very real and tangible reasons. There's the reasons that people can probably see from afar, which is the, the, the work is too big and it just doesn't make sense for us to kind of be competing against each other. That's obvious. Uh, the other piece of it is I really like you. Uh, you're actually a cool guy to, <laughs> to, to work with and I learn a lot from you. And if we don't 
uh, pay attention to each other and try to glean from the experiences, no pun intended again, uh, <laughs> the experiences and the, the intellect and insight that each of us have, then we're, we're leaving something on the table that could potentially be an injustice for the people that we're working for. And at the end of the day, um, when we put our, our, when we lock our arms together and face this uh, challenge uh, in unison, it, it, it makes it tougher for the bad guys to succeed. It makes it tougher for the concept itself uh, to, to overcome us. And, and we're stronger together. So um, we'll continue to make it that way. And I don't see a reason why we wouldn't. So I want us to continue this conversation into the next segment. So, Kurt, stick around with us. Jerry, uh, we'll be right back. He's Kirk Mays. He's the CEO for Forgotten Harvest. And you know, gentlemen, you two at Gleaners Community Food Bank and at Forgotten Harvest, if we could solve food insecurity everywhere else in Michigan, 43% of the people would still, in our state, would still be food insecure here in southeast Michigan. So it makes me think that if we can solve it here... We can solve it anywhere. And conversely, if we can't solve it here, it's not solved. Right. right. Exactly. So we want to we wanna pick this conversation up and uh, kind of peel the uh, layers off this onion with Jerry Brisson, Kirk Mays. I'm Dr. Phil Knight. This is Food for Thought, and we'll be right back. It's Food for Thought with Dr. Phil Knight. Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Phil Knight here with Jerry Brisson, my co-host on Food for Thought. And in the studio here at WJR, Kirk Mays, the CEO of Forgotten Harvest. And uh, Kirk, Jerry, um, this is a conversation as we segue out of the last segment into this that 43% of the people who are food insecure in our state live in southeast Michigan. So the question that we're asking um, is how and why and is this problem solvable Kirk well first I would go back to the strategic thinking the approach right Mm -hmm. so when you say is this problem solvable what problem are you addressing Uh, hunger Uh, 43% of the state having a need for food to go in their belly three times a day Uh, that has to happen you know people are going to survive and we're not going to find a news story soon that's going to show people dying of starvation in the state of Michigan. That's not necessarily where we're going, right? But the fact that 43% of the people in our area um, and in other places in, in the state have to worry about where their next meal is coming from, right. um, have an anxiety that actually goes past the time when they actually physically put something in their mouth and eat. Right. You can You can address physical hunger in a moment and somebody could still be food insecure because they don't know where the next meal or future meal is coming from and that's the problem that i think is the not only solvable issue but it's also something that i think is the more uh pertinent issue to moving the needle on uh this issue in our state uh so if you look at um the conditions that people are are address are, are having to deal with that are uh, that are facing food insecurity, they are uh, trying to decide which commodities and resources that they have, which many times are limited, that they're going to be able to juggle between a food expense and a and a, and a regular living expense. Right. Uh, you have children who potentially are being rationed food um, so they can have enough for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or sometimes just going without meals. And that anxiety of not knowing when they're going to be hungry and how hungry is going to be addressed for a child is a bit more of a burden that I would want my child to go through right now. Uh, The parents that have to go through that um, are stressed out in a way that they're not fully able to dedicate all of their intellectual capacity towards finding a better job, mm-hmm. um, going to school and getting everything they need if they if that's what they're wanting to do, or just being creative to figure out a way that they can actually rise out of their situation or enhance what's going on because you're constantly burdened and worried about how you're going to take care of your most uh, pressing need, which is hunger. Right. So... While hunger is the topic, the problem, in my opinion, to address is food insecurity. In in a way, it's a two-handed 
uh, conversation. It's a two-handed uh, uh, approach because remember, hunger uh, can be can be addressed, and food food insecurity persists. Right. So if we don't make sure we put the infrastructures in place, we partner, we get the right kind of communication, we have the right types of distribution mechanisms in our community uh, so that people know that they, there is a place they can go that when they are worried about where the next meal come from, they can get that answer. And then the other part of it is making sure the right amount of food there and that, and that kind of stuff. So back to your question, is the problem solvable? Yes. We need to be very diligent about what we're going towards. We need to be focused. And I think uh, if we use data to help mm -hmm. us inform our decisions, I think we can do some tremendous things to reduce this pressure that we see on people in our community. Right. We talk about stabilizing, and we've talked about this many times. You know, <clears throat> stabilizing households is the first step to success. Right. And it's not that our definition of success for that household, it's theirs. Right. Whatever their definition of success is, they're not going to find it without having some stabilizing influences, food being one of the critical ones. And so the the work that we're doing at the Food Bank Council now is to really help empower us out here on the front lines, us food banks and food rescue organizations, so that we can bring more of that stability. So I think about the the self-sufficiency standard. You were there for uh, Dr. Pierce's conversation about we got to start with, well, who's hungry? How much do they need to be stabilized? And how much of that stabilizing impact does food have? Yeah, I think I think that is definitely uh, right. And we're going in the right direction. The, the most powerful thing I, I remember from that conversation was uh, the approach to the data and looking at where our thinking comes from or originates from when we look at specific metrics, like for instance, the poverty rate. Uh, it was a powerful statement that, that I absorbed when she explained to us the origin of the poverty rate in our country. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's pretty much 70 years old, um, <laughs> the, the logic behind how we look at family poverty has essentially um, not evolved. Um, the cost of living has changed and all these other factors have changed in the basket of goods that families are expecting to deal with. But we see use the same poverty rate. Mm -hmm. So um, a part of, I think, what I've probably uh, added as far as the thinking to the Food Bank Council and uh, added some headaches for all of us was actually challenging our truth. Right. And and asking the question, well, how do we know that? And then when the when the answer is what well, the data tells us, then the question is, is the data right? Because did we ask the right questions in the data and is the data actually offering us information that's relevant to the solutions that we're trying to find? And unfortunately, no, fortunately, uh, we found that there's some opportunities for us to relook at some of this information, probably give a, bit, a better definition for what uh, some of these metrics mean today. And I think that by itself would help us get closer to a place where the, the problem itself is more solvable. Um, right. When we're actually dealing with information that's contemporary and relevant to not only our solution set, but also to how it affects people's lives today. And that's the aspirin that goes with the headache. That's right. right? <laughs> but that's where we're all headed. And sometimes asking the right questions is the first step toward getting to solutions. We had, we've had, we had a conversation with Senator McGregor. And, you know, his, his first impression of the Food Bank Council was, you're coming to the table with solutions solution-minded right, with a high return on investment. Right. So I think that's another critical aspect of how we work together to get to solving these problems. Absolutely. I, I think that we have a huge opportunity by not only working together as uh, food, emergency food organizations, and in some respects that, that, that title is becoming a misnomer is more and more families are becoming dependent on uh, the food that we provide, not just for the emergency situation, but literally to help make ends meet and, and as a subsidy to their overall income and everything they're doing. Uh, so as we look at that, we're looking at families that are going across the social and economic uh, spectrum. These are not homogenous challenges that say hungry people go through these things. So uh, 
I think not only do we have an opportunity to partner as again as 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 food banks, but there's an p- opportunity also to reach out and partner with other social service organizations that are actually helping to move the quality of life metrics of people's lives, whether it's energy assistance, whether it's um, workforce development training, and all these other pieces. Uh, when somebody comes to uh, one of our partners to get served. Food is the most urgent and most pressing need they may have at that moment, but it's not the only one. And to, be, to get a better handle on all the data, all the demand, and all the needs that people are actually uh, 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 going through right now will give us a better understanding of who we need to part with, partner with, where dollars need to go, and how we can actually come up with formul- formulated uh, solution sets that I think will start moving our whole state forward. Well, I think one of the things that uh, strikes me from the conversation that you guys are having right here is one of the missions that you as board members have given to the Food Bank Council is to create the blueprint to solve hunger in Michigan. And you can't create a solution if you don't understand the problem. That's right. And if you can't define the problem. And I think that's really what you're doing. And I love what you did. And we've we've done it in earlier shows to, to make the difference between hunger and food insecurity. And, it, and why you've got to put a Band-Aid on the bullet wound, so right. to speak, with solving hunger and giving people access to food, then, but the real issue to attack and, and take on is food insecurity, and you can't do that alone. You've got to have quality of life metrics that help move this needle. So we're going to have to come back. Um, I'm going to make a strategic executive decision and say we're going to have to continue this conversation for one more segment. He's Jerry Brisson. Of uh, Gleaners Community Food Bank, Kirk Mays for CEO of Forgotten Harvest. I'm Dr. Phil Knight, and this is Food for Thought. You're listening to Food for Thought with Dr. Phil Knight, brought to you by Farm Bureau Insurance of Michigan and the Food Bank Council of Michigan. Our guest in studio today, Kirk Mays. And, um, you know, Kirk, when I'm out uh, speaking in public, um, which happens a lot, and lots of opportunities, because this food insecurity and hunger are becoming top of the mind mm-hmm. for because of the, the, honestly, because of the economic impact, the educational impact. And I will say to folks, um, you know, that I might say that They'll say there's seven food banks that make up the council, and I sometimes I have to take the time to correct them and say there's really six food banks and one food rescue operation, mm-hmm. because I think that that's a, maybe a little bit of a nuance for people who are listening to our show, but it's really true. And while you and uh, Jerry share the same mission of creating food security, you do approach it a bit differently, and because of that difference, I think it's you're able to add volume to the to the solution of the problem absolutely so uh thank you for that phil uh the reality is uh the forgotten harvest model is set it up is set up as a as a supply driven model if there wasn't uh food that was being wasted that essentially is good food fresh food that could go to families in need um in our country then you wouldn't need an organization like forgotten harvest right Uh, our purpose is not only to uh, get food that would have otherwise gone to waste to people in to to families in need uh, it is also to reduce food waste and um, we understand that 130 billion pounds of food according to the usda uh, is going to be wasted in america this year right Um, 70 plus billion pounds last year so forgotten harvest was created as a mechanism specifically to address that challenge and then redirect that food to people in need whereas a food bank was constructed as almost like a store house uh, uh, the community's emergency place where food would be uh, the Jerry's uh, measure of health is how much food you have in your warehouse essentially our measure of health is how much our trucks are on the ground and how much food we don't have in our warehouse essentially we want to fluidly move that stuff from one place to the next so 
it presents a number of different dynamics in our business model. Together, we're able to contribute about 80 million pounds of food per year to the community. And what you have is two systems working at an optimal way, and we still find ways that we could actually probably improve on that going forward. So, you know, I think a lot of people, when they look at uh, either businesses or even particularly nonprofits, they, they have an either-or mindset. And you guys have a together and. Yeah. It's not either or. It's what can we do together. And and there is some crossover. But when you bring your system and your emphasis and that that mechanism of how you work, that's different than a traditional food bank, then I, I just see an upside here. And when you look at the proof of that, yeah. both of us keep growing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and you can't prove that more than just looking at the facts and saying from when Forgotten Harvest started to today, Gleaners has grown. Yeah. So they're not <laughs> taking away our business, right. right? They're adding to it. And what that means for the community and the partners we serve is they get a great mix and variety of food from everywhere you can get it from. And so those kinds of innovations, in fact, are what we're going to look for to drive the next solution, right? right. We got to right. keep innovating. Forgotten Harvest was a critical innovation when food banking hit a certain plateau. Yeah. What a wonderful opportunity for the community to be fed cheaper and better. Yeah. Well, I that's and entirely true. Yeah. That's yeah. entirely true. But on the humanity side, on the leadership side, what I'm watching here in the studio today, which I've seen in board meetings and I've seen in community meetings, the interaction between you two, it's not competition, it's completion. And it's probably why some people look at us and go, why, why can't you guys all work together? Okay, well, we are. Yeah. So, so listen, I mean, it, there's okay, it's okay to be competitive uh, and, and we can still be friends, right? And uh, we can be collaborative and still be competitive. Uh, you know, I, I know my favorite, my best friend from middle school was the guy who I was always trying to get a better grade on in the test. And we ended up at the end of our middle school careers uh, vying for who would go be the salutator salutatorian. Right. Uh, of course, the valedictorian was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I won't do is be venomous. What I won't be do is be malicious. And what I won't ever do is forget that whoever goes through that door, we're both working for the same purpose right. for people in need. And sometimes that means that if Jerry's better off going through that door than me, I need to swallow my pride, swallow my ambition, step aside, and give my hat off to the bigger picture, which is allowing yeah. gleaners to do what they're supposed to do. For so, the sake of the mission. Absolutely. So there are certain things that we have made a dedication that we won't do because gleaners does it. We won't do SNAP benefit programs. We won't do the big backpack programs at the end of the year. There are certain things that you guys do that we see as your lane. And if we do want to get into that stuff to enhance what we're doing for our clients, we're going to call you. I think it's very important for us to focus our energies and put our work where it needs to be so that we can do the most with what we have. You know, I, I will say that you live everything you just said. And I think uh, it, it's the same is true on our side, that uh, whoever goes through that door has the responsibility and the opportunity. And my job, when you're the one that walks through the door, is to make sure I'm supporting you in your responsibility. And uh, you do have a lot of responsibility. And I want to get to that in specific. Three things you're doing right now that are most important to you for making progress. Uh, so... We are, uh, when I came in, I, I came in um, entering into a 25th year for Forgotten Harvest. So that presented a great opportunity for me as a new leader of the organization to ask ourselves the question, what could we do in, to, in order to make Forgotten Harvest the best that we could potentially be? What we identified was that we can do a better job at focusing on the conditions of people who are end users. If we're gonna get better, if we're gonna improve uh, Forgotten Harvest to be the best it could be, the, the people who should feel it the most are the people who basically walk home with the food. So we started looking at our work and asking ourselves the question, what are people experiencing when they're going through the challenge of food insecurity? And ultimately, what we came up, to, came up with was their People are struggling with the information, knowing where the next meal is coming from, one. Two, access, understanding how to get there and isn't it proximity and is it practical to be able to go and get the type of food available and get it back to their home destination. And three, um, essentially supply. 
what kind of stuff is there? And are we doing everything we can to give somebody from diverse communities throughout the state of throughout Southeast Michigan a chance to get what they need need based on their cultural background, based on their taste preference and that kind of stuff and nutritional balance. So what we've done in order to start to address those questions is we actually solicited the, the help of uh, some of our local uh professionals. We got Data Driven Detroit to help us look at our distribution map and also develop a food insecurity index for Forgotten Harvest to help us understand where people are uh, most at risk for food insecurity within our region relative to each other. We also um, asked them to collect data about where Gleaners was distributing food, where we're distributing food and a lot of our other partners so we can get a better understanding of if we were to reconsider our distribution, where would be the optimal places for us to actually have our distribution points and partnerships given where everybody else is? We're finding that we're in good places and uh, we're well positioned next to um, our, our current partners with you guys and everything right now, but we're gonna continue to drill down and ask questions and to make sure that we're in the right places. And the third thing that we've done was we actually uh, enlisted the services of Gafari and Associates, a local architecture firm that also has has a, the ability to do logistics analysis, and we asked them to do an analysis of our entire logistics uh, uh, service, our, our operation, and also our facility, so we can maximize the nutrition, the, the, the mix of food that Forgotten Harvest gets to go out to the community. While we can't source like gleaners can and pick from a list and buy the stuff and actually get the specific thing items that people are looking for we get a variety of things a robust variety of things on a daily basis that we don't currently mix in an optimized way so what we're looking to do is to actually uh, reconfigure our our base operations so that we'll be able to bring things back uh, change up some of our volunteer assignments and then actually uh, provide the greatest and most equitable mix of the daily donations to Forgotten Harvest out to the community so that supply side will actually be addressed. Um, that's putting us in a strategic planning process that we're working on right now for the next three to five years just kicked off. Uh, we've got a real estate committee that's actually helping us look for new real estate within the region and uh, we're I'm going to be launching a capital campaign here soon uh, to, to raise some cash, a lift, to potentially get a new facility and help us get to where we are. Uh, but collecting this data, looking for new ways to mix and get uh, better quality and dependable uh, service out to the community, um, and then making better decisions with data to identify where we're going and how much food we're actually getting out there is what I think about every day right now. As a matter of fact, it's not even 2017 in my <laughs> mind anymore. It's like 2018 <laughs> and a half. Uh, and uh, right. that's, that's what I live, sleep, and breathe right now. Awesome. And your success is our success. I just want to be clear. Anything, anything you listeners do for Forgotten Harvest is also helping gleaners. That's right. Because Likewise. Because it, it gets to the people we serve and it gets to a food secure community, which we need to get to together. That's right. And I would just want to like to, 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 to mention uh, a moment we had together that I don't think anybody else in the world knows about. So I was offered... Uh, quick opportunity to go visit the White House and go and speak on behalf of Metro Detroit, uh, along with um, leadership from Eastern Market about food in, right. in Metro Detroit. I that. Um, it dawned on me, I was one of two. I was one of two to talk about this. And I quickly picked up the phone, um, left Jerry a message that night, Jerry gave me a call and we talked about what we were gonna talk about when we walked into the White House about hunger and food in, in Metro Detroit. So I think that reflects, I think the sincerity of our relationship and the way we think about each other, even when nobody's looking. If you'd like to know more about the work of Forgotten Harvest, you can find them on the web at forgottenharvest.org. He's Kirk Mays, he's the CEO of Forgotten Harvest. Kirk, thanks for investing yourself your one handful of life in this mission, and thanks for being with us here on Food for Thought. It's Food for Thought with Dr. Phil Knight. And now a Farm Bureau Insurance of Michigan moment. I have on the phone with me Jerome Blazak. Jerome, you and your wife, Mary, have a greenhouse here in Wayne County, and I'm reading here that you've donated more than 21,000 pounds of surplus food. 
I cannot imagine that, and how awesome is that? Thank you so much for your contribution. Well, uh, we've taken, uh, basically, uh, what I do is, uh, when I take in, uh, do my planning, uh, I'll take in, uh, like, uh, squashes, summer squashes. I'll take in, plant so many rows, uh, uh, probably early uh, in May. And then in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, then I'll take and uh, I'll plant uh, uh, a few more rows. And like last year, what had happened was that the uh, first planting uh, did not germinate really well. Okay. So uh, on my next planting, okay, I double planted. Okay, great. So you're and, determined then. Pardon? You're determined. Oh yes, because uh, uh, I can uh, make sure that I have uh, produce. I, I've come up years ago where okay, I only planted uh, so many and ended up didn't have anything. So now I take and I uh, I take and space out my plantings and. Uh, to make sure that I have ample food. Oh, Jerome, tell me, tell me why you do this. Why do you, why do you plant this, or double plant, or do whatever it takes so that you can donate this much produce to make sure that people have access to healthy, nutritious food? Well, uh, in our community, uh, we have uh, quite a few people uh, that do not have ample food, hmm. and. Uh, uh, when you plant uh, produce, we, uh, we were going to Eastern Market at that time. Uh, we just uh, stopped because of our health uh, a couple years ago. We just do local markets now. But anyway, uh, we take in, uh, we make sure that we have enough uh, produce uh, for our markets, and the excess uh, goes to uh, charity. Well, that's outstanding, and you're making a tremendous difference. He's Jerome Blazak, and he and his wife Mary are hunger champions, donating more than 21,000 pounds of surplus produce. Jerome, thank you for being on the Farm Bureau Moment. What a great conversation, Jerry, with Kirk Mays, the CEO at Forgotten Harvest. And reflective of all the conversations I have with Kirk. He's a smart guy. He's a capable capable guy. I really enjoy working with him. It's, it's, it's a powerful conversation, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Well, as we come to the end of the show, let me share some food for thought, and it's really short this week, and that is simply this. From the result of the conversation that I heard between you and Kirk, food is a powerful force for good, and it can make a difference in people's lives, in our communities, and in, we think, all across our state. Thanks for listening to Food for Thought. This is Dr. Phil Knight, and you're listening to WJR. Food for Thought has been a presentation of Farm Bureau Insurance of Michigan and the Food Bank Council of Michigan, creating a food-secure state.